B2B Marketers, we're back with our third installment of B2B Beacon's Leadership and Luminary series. I'm your host, Thad Kalo, CEO of Business Online and Executive Editor of B2B Beacon. Well, we're here in the lovely, windy city of Chicago, home to some of the best T-bones, deep dish pie, and of course, one of the largest and most recognized B2B marketing associations and event in the world, the BMA, now a a But more importantly, we are here with Joe Polizzi, who is the head of the Content Marketing Institute Right? That, you got it. That and was Joe, you know, I got a beef. I got a beef with you, I'll be honest. That's okay. how I'm going to start this. All right. I got a real issue. Because of you being a pioneer in this whole content marketing world, there's so much gosh darn content out there. I don't yeah. know how to fight through and find the stuff that's relevant, that's interesting, and well constructed. So thank you, but no thank you. I don't know. Hey, you're right. I mean, I, I talked this morning at the event, and. I'm like, hey, this is great content marketing. The business itself is doing fantastic. Nine out of 10 marketers are using some form of content marketing. I'm like, it's a great business to be in, maybe the fastest growing area of internet marketing. But at the same time, we only had 8% of B2B marketers that say they're significantly effective with content marketing. There's just a whole lot of horrible content. What's the scariest thing of all is that most of these B2B marketers have no documented strategy. If they do have one, they're not following it and they're their budgets around content marketing are growing so fast. Get prepared. I, I'm sorry to say this. Get prepared for even more, <laughs> more horrible more bad content. content. Well, this is why you know what's why I'm out there sort of evangelizing this concept, and I'm, I've moved away from do it to hey, if you're not going to commit to it and really get a strategy behind it, go, go do something else. You know, right. you, you have to invest your time and resources, and maybe the best thing. It, it's not rocket science. You really just need a plan, but most B2B marketers aren't doing it. So let's talk about that plan for a second. I like that. And let's talk about the framework for thinking about content marketing outside of what you would actually do and how you map it to the journey and all those things, yeah. which we can get into. How are some of the best content marketers actually thinking about approaching creating content? What's their mindset? What are they, you know, they're putting on that, you know, that, that game helmet and what are they thinking about? You know, it's interesting. We just did dozens and dozens of interviews with the small B2B companies that didn't have any resources and just started. What they've done is, it's, it's not rocket science, it's very simple. They said, okay, we're going to consistently deliver content over, with a key, uh, one key content type. So that could be audio, video, textual, to one key platform. That could be your blog, your website, maybe iTunes if you're doing podcasts, or uh, maybe on YouTube if you're doing videos. You consistently deliver content on time, in particular, like a media company would over a particular time, over a long period of time. And this is the interesting thing is why most B2B marketers don't get there. About 15 to 17 months is what it takes to really build an audience over this so that if they know you, they like you, they trust you more, and then you can really just sell whatever you want. It's almost selling without selling because you're creating so much value, value there. Most B2B marketers don't get there because they're budgeting this thing and they're saying, okay, well, let's look at it at six to nine months. Yeah, you can, you can get more leads in. You can maybe get more qual quality leads. But if you're gonna say, hey, we wanna be the leading informational provider in a niche, that takes time and it takes a focus on audience building, on subscriber growth. Yep. And if we look at our most recent research, what we found out is just three in 10 B2B marketers are actually have subscriber growth as a goal. So that means they're creating a lot of content in a lot of different channels, but they're not actually getting opt-in permission from a subscriber. And I think that's the, the key thing. Like if you look at the great media companies of all time, what do they do? They build an audience. Mm -hmm. That's why I think so many B2B marketers are failing because they're not building audience. They're sort of just cluttering up the, the web sphere with a bunch of content all over the place like you were talking about. You know, that's interesting. There's a lot there. So let me, let me press on one thing. In, in terms of the, the content that's being consumed, which, which, which grows subscribership, as we think as, as being a publisher or a quasi-publisher, yeah. if you will, um, you know what? What are the what are the best doing? How are they thinking about creating it? Because the concern I have is they're 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 creating with the mindset of what they want to tell the world, as opposed to the notion of giving first. Hey, here's what I know you need. Let me let me build a relationship with you and give you something first before I ask you to consume, mm -hmm. you know, content around who we are and why we're yeah. we are so great at what we do. Well, I'll, I'll give you a quick story to sort of accentuate the point. So I was doing a presentation in Toronto about nine months ago. Large B two B marketer, one of the largest ones, and we all know what the name would be. And she, the, the blog editor comes up to me and she says, Joe, I'm, we're really struggling with our blog. And I said, okay, let's break it down. What's going on? Where are you struggling with? And lo and behold, I, I got to the question, well, how many of your personas are you targeting with that blog? Seriously. And she said, well, technically we have a list of 18 different personas or archetypes Jeez. that we are trying to target with the blog. 
And I said, well, you can pay me now because I found your problem. <laughs> I said, there's no way you can be relevant and on content point to 18. I said, here's what you really need to do. I said, you need to target one yeah. with this particular blog. And I used the, the example of the Huffington Post. Yep. So the Huffington Post today has 150 different channels, but they started with one to one type of audience that they were going after. And then they were growing up. Here's another one. We're going to get into this green marketing. We're going to get into sustainability. We're going to get into this type of politics. And they started to go and knock them off. And that's what I talked to this company about. You have to do it that way. And the other thing was, as we looked at the content in this particular case, it was almost all bait and switch type content. Oh, here's your problem. And then this is how our product will help. Yeah. We have so much of that content at that point where if you look at the buyer's and journey. And we can smell it, right? We smell it quickly. You can quickly get to it in two paragraphs and you see they're going to lead you into just like buy now, call it's, now, right? Well, here's what I talked about this morning. It's okay to sell, mm -hmm. but you have to build the value first. You have to build the relationship there. So what we see in most situations, and I use this morning like copy blogger media, um, they, have, they have over 200,000 subscribers, B2B software as a service company. They went about 15 months or so and just built that audience over time and didn't monetize that for a long time. Yeah. Now they can sell whatever they want. They're selling training, they're selling their software, they're, and the people don't mind because they've gotten so much value from the content. Yeah. And most B2B companies just don't get there. So if I was to give some advice, I'd say, look, please, you, you have all kinds of opportunities. Focus on like, what are, you, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to grow sales? Are you trying to save costs? Are you trying to create more happier customers? That customer loyalty, which I think is the best place to start, like with your current customers. And then what do you want those current customers to do? You want them to stay longer? Do you want them to talk more about your company? And then what is the content niche to that one type of persona? Because you have many. So yep. the average B2B company, let's say they have eight different personas. Let's just start at the one, let's do the pilot, and let's create the idea around what's the content niche that we can actually be the leading informational provider in the world. When I talk to most CMOs about that, they're like, well, that's, that's unrealistic. No, it's not. It's just you haven't used that muscle before. Yep. Really look at that niche and, how, and then you put the resources to that and then be patient. We have such a lack of patience, and I get it, right? You get it. We work with CMOs all the time, different size companies, and they're like, I need... I need results now. And, I said, yeah. and basically, I tell them, look, if you need results in less than 12 months, go advertise. Yeah, go buy. Go, go buy. Go buy go media. Buy. Go do something else. But if you want to create a long-term relationship with customers through a content experience, it takes time to do that. We, at Pantos on Patent Media, we used to do three-year plans. Wow. Why three-year plans? Because we knew it took time to build a long-term relationship mm -hmm. through content. It's just a different way to go to market. Well, and I think you hit on something there, Joe, which is interesting because you, know, you talk about the short-term needs versus the long-term play. And sometimes they get mixed, right? Because there is this, this hard and fast need to hit numbers. So therefore, we're taking an advertorial approach to how do I get leads through content yeah. marketing. But yet, really, content marketing is much more mid to long-term play. And if you don't have that patience, you're going to mix you know, your, your, your outcomes in terms of what, what approach you're taking to actually drive you know, specific business outcomes. And I think that's a big challenge. Well, what I would say is, and let's be realistic, you can still focus on the short, and I get it. You know, we've got... If you, if you look at most B2B companies, they're sort of, they feel like they're subservient to sales, right? It's yep. a sales driven culture. So you've got these demands and, and sales think, okay, well, you're there, you're marketing, you're here for us. What we want to do, we want to collaborate a little bit. So I get that. I mean, how can we help them? How can we look at some sales alignment issues and, and, and engagement around to help them get that entirely. But at the same time, we've got to do some pilots over here. Yep. Beg, borrow and steal to get there. So I always say, okay, do a six month pilot. Get the executives in the room. Get them around and say, hey, here's what we're trying to do. Here's the content niche that we feel if we become the go-to resource, we can deliver on all these goals long term. Short term, yes. We can, maybe we'll get found in search engines a little bit more. Sure. Short term, yes. Maybe we'll get some more leads. But long term, here's the vision. So paint the vision for them and then guide them along the path and you'll show them. If you can get six months and you can get into that room and say, here's what we're going for in six months and if I deliver on these lower level metrics is what I would call them. I want six more months budget. I think you have to do that because I think if you, if you get to that 12 to 18 month mark, then you'll really start to say the holy grail is, okay, here's my subscriber database. Yep. I'm going to take that. And I'm going to compare it with my customer database. What's different? And that's where we're seeing all the magic happen because the differences are they're staying longer. They're buying more when they buy. They're talking more about us as an organization. They're, they're actually we don't have to market as much and spend as much because it's an asset that continually sorts of grow, grows on itself 
over time as opposed to paying for that media. I mean, I love that. I mean, I think that's a big piece that a lot of us miss, right? Outside of using content marketing to bring in potentially new clients, but it's actually helping support them for a longer lifetime value, right? Yep. They're, they're gonna stick around more. And then you've got a vehicle, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you have a vehicle to interact with them over time, whereas before you would have to go out there and market to them again, right? I mean, you can well, imagine the cost savings in that. Think about this. Let's just say we were starting at zero, and you, you know, we're, we're, you and I are going in, we're training, we're advising our clients. Would we actually go in and say, let's, uh, l let's say everybody starts at zero. Would we go in and say, okay, let, let's wait till other people build platforms, and then let's create interrupted media around those platforms and see how it does. But we would say, let's create the, the destination. Yeah. Let's be the expert. It's yeah. almost like we've been doing this so long for 50, 60 years with mass media, even targeted mass media. We forgot that the best way is to communicate directly with our customers by delivering value throughout the buyer's journey. Yep. And we've sort of, I think, got lost along the way. Yeah. So there's two key things I can take out of this in, in summary. Number one is aligning the objectives to, to your content marketing strategy. Make sure you understand the long-term play and even the short-term play, but, but align that properly. Number two is audience. Like be, be relevant to your audience. Think of them first, and you're going to have to probably create micro segments in your content marketing strategy to, to be relevant to those mm -hmm. folks, which is good. Let me, let me talk about, I think, a third pillar to this, which I think is woven into some of the context of this conversation. Um, which is you know, really driven around folks who can actually deliver the content that's interesting and they have a point of view that actually draws them in. So where are we in that spectrum of finding those folks? Who are they? Um, how do you identify them? Can you turn people who were journalists or not journalists in, into producers? You know, what, what are the best doing in that area? Well, the first thing I would say is before you go and create all this content, look at what you have. Do a content audit. I just talked to somebody who became head of content for a very large B2B company and they were saying, well, where do I get started? I said, well, don't go out, you know, don't create the strategy and then go create content. See what you have. You might have some assets that you can work with and do a, con do a proper content audit sure. to see what you can use. Then you do that gap analysis and say, okay, wh where, where in the buyer's journey are we missing some content? Or where to our goal of being the leading ex expert, where do we need some stuff, let's say. The first thing is strategy has to stay internal. Like somebody in the organization has to drive strategy. Outside of that, I've seen it work multiple ways. I've seen, you know, there's, there's B2B companies that are doing what Red Bull did and they're creating Red Bull Media House internally or Marriott's doing it with their content hub. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, look, we want to be the leading media companies in our industry. We're seeing that happen on B2B, but we're also seeing, hey, let's work with some really amazing agency partners who have expertise in these industries to do that. Or maybe we should hire some journalists. Yep. I would say the most important role that's lacking in B2B organizations is probably an editor. And the editor fu functions, of course, let's take the lens and look at the content we have and how do we focus on the pain points ongoing with the customers that we're mm -hmm. trying to talk to. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, how do we coordinate with our employees, which are probably the most important content assets that we have, the yep. employees that are subject matter experts in the company that don't think of creating content as their job, but I think that, open, actually, OpenView Venture Partners, you know, VC out of Boston, I love what they did because they said, when you get hired at OpenView, part of your job is to create content. So 90% of the people that work at OpenView now are responsible for creating content. There's a board and they, they actually say, how many page views, how many shares, how many subscribers are we picking up from each Employee, each employee, wow. and, and what cool. they've done—they've given away trips to Tahiti and stuff like that. I mean, it's—it's a—they put an executive force behind it, and it makes a difference. Now, how do you coordinate that? You need a content marketing director or an sure. editor to coordinate that and to make sure that they understand how you know how does this work. Start with the five percent of the employees that actually want to do it that maybe already have their blog, maybe yeah. are already good in social media. Don't worry about the other ninety-five percent at this point get some people talking about it, share those results, and then I'll, I think you'll see some, uh, some positive outcomes in the future. But let me ask you a question on that, because part, part of my fear in that type of equation is some of those folks just aren't good at writing. They're, you know, they, 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 they are subject matter expert, which is why they're, you know, they're employed, yeah. um, but they may not be good at communicating to, to the external prospects and client base. Is there a mechanism to, 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 to extract that value, you know, and, and, and do they need to be the original author? So here's where that bottlenecks in that process. You're the content marketing editor and you come in and you have a collaboration tool or a workflow tool and you're like, this is gonna be great. And I'm gonna send a note to these employees and I'm gonna say, I want 750 words and I want it by here and here's the process and here's the approvals. 
and then you're going to hear crickets. <laughs> like nothing's going to happen. So what I need to do with you is I need to go to you and I'm like, okay, here's your subject matter expertise. Here's the part of the, the gap analysis that I need you to fill. Then I need to get the content however I can. It, the raw content, maybe I videotape you. Maybe um, because you're traveling, maybe you're going to take notes on your iPhone and you're going to talk about key concepts and then I'm going to take that and have and assign an editor to that and make that into storytelling gold. Yep. Uh, maybe it's an email Q&A. Get the raw content however you can. It's the biggest mistake that's made. I just need your expertise. I will help you tell the story. You can then review it. That's the, the winning formula because yep. even at OpenView, they're not. Like, because it can be I, intimidating too, well, right? Like you, look, you don't want people aren't writers don't want people reading their work if they if they don't feel confident. But look at look, Indium Corporation is a really good example. It's, it's mid you know mid size small mid sized manufacturing organization. They manufacture industrial soldering equipment, so really sexy stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. And they have engineers that need to create the content for the blog. They've been blogging since two thousand five. Well, I mean, you've worked with engineers. They're not the greatest, usually the greatest writers in the yep. world. So you have to help them tell their stories. So don't force them into a bucket to make your process easier. You have to work around their schedule because they have a job to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, good stuff. We're, we're, we're heating up here. Let's talk about measurement, right? Because sure. there, you know, there's the issue around producing content, producing valuable content, connecting it with your audience, making sure there's relevancy. But how do you begin to understand if you're breaking through, you know, outside of audience growth growing, which is probably a fairly yep. easy metric to, to measure, but how do you begin to understand that this is actually providing value, is delivering reciprocity, and is actually at the end of the day delivering meaningful business outcomes? Like, what, what are the best folks doing? Um, well, this is, so this is a B2B, B2C example, one of my favorite ones. So uh, TD Ameritrade, they target um, businesses that trade a lot. So these business groups and traders that they're trading 50, 100 times yeah. a day. And they had a magazine targeted to them called Think Money Magazine. They started it years ago with a pet project with the CEO. TD Ameritrade uh, trade buys Thinkorswim and gets the magazine Think Money. This is, it's struggling to hold on because of course it's a print magazine, print and digital magazine, how do we keep it going? They said, wait, we need some time to show that this is really working. It took them two years to get the data. That's why I'm talking about patience. Sometimes it takes time. They then said, okay, well, who's subscribing and reading this magazine? They get the, have that data, which is fairly easy to get. It just takes the time to get it over time, like who's actually reading it? And they took that and they looked at it against their customer list. They said, what's the difference? What they found out is that those people that read that magazine trade five times more than those that don't. So now the CEO is holding it up and like, this is the greatest it's thing gold. ever. <laughs> it's never going to get cut. I mean, any B2B company can do that. It just takes the time sure. to do that. So if you build the opt-in subscriber relationship like a media company would, and then over time say, okay, what's the difference between these subscribers and non-subscribers? Great. Okay. So that's sort of the ultimate holy grail to this thing. And then you can figure out, do they buy more? Do they stay longer? Connected Those to revenue. I mean, that's, that's the key piece. At some point, we need to, outside of understanding downloads and views and watches yeah. and all of this stuff, it's that person who's reading this stuff is buying. There's only three reasons. Sales, savings, or sunshine. And I talked about it this morning. Is this driving sales? Is it saving costs? Which is, I like sales better than costs, but I get it. Sure. And the third one is customer retention and loyalty. Yep. Is it creating happier customers? Are we seeing positive customer behaviors? That leads to revenue as well. So a good little um, to-do, and we do this workshop with a lot of our the big companies we work with. We have them sit down. The average company distributes their content in 13 to 15 different ways. So they got webinars and podcasts and eBooks and all kinds of stuff. Yep. And we have them listed. So I want you to list your e-newsletter, you're distributing content on Facebook. Go down the line of all the content you're distributing. Then put why question mark at the top. And I want to know the business reason behind that. Why do you have that print newsletter? Why do you have that e-newsletter? Why are you sharing content on Facebook? Most of what we find out, very low level metrics like Oh, we're you know we're increasing web traffic, yeah. or um, and maybe it's leads or engagement. What does that mean? Yeah, Engage we're going to see positive engagement. Well, if, if you need to take that and we need to match it to sales savings or sunshine, if you can't, that's why I talked about this morning about web traffic. Everybody, number one way of met uh, uh, B2B marketers use to show. ROI for their content marketing is web traffic. And I'm like, what does that mean? Yep. I, you and I can both take an analytics chart. Doesn't mean much these days. Well, we yeah. can, you and I can both take an analytics chart and say, oh, it's going up and to the right. Everything's great. 
But I don't even know, okay, is that web traffic leading to subscribers? And do subs having subscribers mean that it's delivering on sales savings or customer retention loyalty issues? That's what we need to do. So we need to connect the dots with the lower level metrics to subscribers to sales or savings or sunshine. And, and most people don't do that. So the first step is identify why we're doing these things. Because what will happen is you'll figure out, I don't know, oh, we we're doing that because we've always done it. Or, uh, or I don't know the goal behind the e-newsletter. Or I don't know the goal behind our sharing what we're sharing on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. Well, then we have to find out, and then you need to connect the dots because what's happening in these B2B, you know, big conglomerate in these divisions, they're not talking to each other. So yep. when we go in for advisory days, we're doing meet and greets. Like some of these product directors and managers have never met each other before. And they all have diplomat, aren't you, in that scenario? Well, they all have their <laughs> own content marketing groups, and they're yeah. not working with each other. So the first thing is we've all got to get on the same page. It's just a muscle that these organizations aren't used to using, so we've got to work it out a little bit and get to a point where we're comfortable with it and we can do something with it. Yeah, and it's refreshing to hear that you know, creating this content is, is, is beyond you know, growing readership and audience and engagement, but it, you know, that connecting it through, through your three S's, I think that's you know, huge because we often forget that. And, and regardless of where we are in the food chain, um, if we can connect that to some level degree, not only, hopefully, if you're doing it well, will we'll, you be able to maintain that type of budget and resources, but you'll be able to grow it because that's what they're looking for. Well, let's just say you, you mentioned before about like we're all quasi publishers, we're all publishers today. I mean, I grew up in publishing. The only, I mean, our goal for circulation development or audience development was to generate revenue. I mean, and how, how do we make money directly off of our audience? Yep. It's just so. There's no difference to what any of the B2B companies you and I are working with that aren't media companies. It's just how the money comes in. So traditionally, a publisher makes money off of, oh, I'm going to sell advertising against it, or I'm going to uh, have paid content offerings or subscription offerings to that. For the most part, that's 99% of the revenue that comes in for media companies. Well, there's no difference in that. There's your audience, and what I want to do is, oh, I'm going to sell more products or more services, or I'm going to keep customers longer so I can sell more revenue. You have to connect it to sales, and yep. if you don't, I honestly don't know what you're doing. You know, and let, let's talk about content marketing world and content marketing institute in one second. But one last question for you there, and I'm always curious. This is just, you know, uh, seeing the, the the world that we live in change so fast. What's happened to publishers? Because if now all of B2B marketers yeah. are publishers, and they're producing content, and there's more content out there, and we're consuming that content, and so our you know our attention span and, and availability to consume the, our you know the, the traditional publishers' content is is, is shrinking. What, what's what's going on in their world? How are they adjusting? Well, outside of a few uh, that are really getting heavy, like if you look at a BuzzFeed, the majority of their content is off of native advertising, so it's all sponsored content. So there's these new models around sponsored content. I don't know how long those are going to last. But what I see, so you're skeptical on the sponsor. I'm skeptical okay. long. I'm skeptical long. I think you, I think in a BuzzFeed world, in a consumer world, as long as it's entertaining, you can do that. It's much more difficult than B two B to just focus on a sponsored content model. Look at Forbes magazine. Mm -hmm. Forbes magazine drives the majority of their content off a of contributor post and sponsored content now, and that hurt when they they sold themselves. They didn't they didn't sell it's a high enough value is what the owners thought because I think that that content has taken a hit. Mm -hmm. Their credibility has taken a hit because of it. What I see happening, and I don't know, I mean, I'm terrible at predictions in time, but let's just say in the next five to ten years, you and I won't be able to distinguish between a media company and a non-media company because what Intel and Qualcomm and John Deere are doing are going to, from a marketing and a promotion standpoint, are going to look so similar to what a media company does. So what does that mean for a media company? Mm -hmm. Media company is going to have to sell products. I mean, if you look at look at Wall Street Journal, right? I mean, they've got they've started to dabble in. It. I mean, remember the Wall Street Journal Wine Club? Yep. That was a product yep. that Wall Street Journal offered. I think you're going to see more of that. I think that if you were going to say so a different way of monetizing their customers, different way they're going outside of advertising. You're, well, how are you going to how are you going to monetize it with advertising when when fewer and fewer people are spending money on advertising? Yeah. So that's a tough challenge. How are you going to charge for your content when fewer people are actually paying for content when it's available for free? But the business of media has never been better. The business model is broken. Mm -hmm. So I really see, so what's my way? So, I mean, we're a media company, Content Marketing Institute. What's our way out of it? So we have products such as the events that we sell, our online training programs, our advisory days, consulting. Those are, that's how we monetize it very differently than a way a traditional media company would monetize it. I don't see any difference in the model. It'll, we're all going to be media companies, but we're all monetizing it by selling products and services. Yeah, which is interesting, and I think there's there's real um, 
there's real legs to that. It's a bit scary though as well because I don't know that all of these companies will be good at that piece of their, their business, right? And I think those that do have a better opportunity. Well, so, for so here's the last success. thing that I'll say on it because sure. I think this is, this is where I really think it's gonna get exciting in, the, in our little world. I think that the media, niche media companies in B2B, their future is actually to build themselves up and to build a, such a valuable audience that they get purchased by big brands that you and I work with. Because big brands are very, we've talked about this, they're struggling at doing this. Yep. Well, hey, look, there's a company out there that's got a content factory, yep. they've got a subscriber base. What, can we monetize that? Absolutely, we're gonna buy them and bring them in house and I think that's gonna happen more and more. All right, let's talk a little bit, let's talk a little about Orange, if you will. So if, if you're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you're, uh, if you're out there in the B2B world and you, you need to figure this stuff out, what are some opportunities to, to, to educate yourself, get involved, sure. um, and really grow you know, the department yourself, your career, you know, your organization in this world of, of content marketing? Well, contentmarketinginstitute.com, I mean, we are focused on training and education yep. for marketers around the world. That's, that's our sole purpose, advancing the practice of content marketing. So if you don't want to spend any money, lots of free tools, free newsletters, free eBooks, free webinars, you can get that all day long. If you're really serious about it, content marketing world, as you've talked about, I mean, we'll have over 3,000 marketers from 50 plus countries in Cleveland, Ohio, September 8th through 11th this year. What I love about that, that's a place where you bring your team. Yeah. Like Dell last year brought 17 people from their team. Brockwell Automation brought 23 people because what's, what, it's, t it's tough if you're the sole content champion and you learn all this and you get excited and then you bring it back to an organization that shuts the door in your face. So you need allies in the organization, yeah. get them trained on going, and then we have the online training so that you can continue your, your training and proficiency around everything related to content marketing. And, I'll, I'll, and from a content marketing world perspective, I've been, and it's fantastic, and I, I highly recommend going. Great networking, great thought leadership. The only problem is in Cleveland, but I'll, I'll let that slide for oh. now. You know? I mean, granted, <laughs> granted, granted, you're in the NBA Finals, and LeBron is back, and there's an excitement and, and energy in the air, but it's tough to get to, but we'll, we'll let that slide. And let's talk about the um, the online training, so you can actually go and get certified. And you know, what does that look like? Courses, you know. So there's over 20 hours work, uh, available right now from the leading content experts in the world, all around from planning to strategy, audience building to measurement. So depending on where your content gaps are for your training for your education process, we've got it there. Uh, we're adding another 20 hours coming up, so it's a, it's an ongoing subscription that you can have. And where we're seeing companies that are really adopting it is where I'll talk to a CMO and they'll say, look, we need ongoing training. And yep. you know, we've got big companies that are saying, look, I, I need 50 seats or I need 100 seats so that we can, we can have this training ongoing and bake it into our internal training program. That's what I'm excited about. It's not like you or me just signing up, which is great. Yep. I wanna see that, but we need to influence the executive portions and, and the leadership in organizations and, and have them be trained and understand this because as you and I have seen at this conference alone, people have a different definition of what content marketing really is and yeah. how to make it perform for their organization. And, and unfortunately, it's not right for the most part. So we, we need to fix that. So the, the training is there for them if they need it. Yeah, you need to build it into the fabric of the DNA of the organization. If, if B2B marketers are need to be publishers moving forward, they need to understand throughout the marketing organization how to actually get that done. And Start internal first. I always say that before up. you do any content marketing, the first thing you, knew, you need to focus on is internal training and internal communication. And that's how we differentiate first. Well, Joe, as one of the, the nicest guys in the business, one of the smartest guys in the business, I truly appreciate this opportunity, and I know the, the viewership will love this. Thank you know, you. Anyth anytime you ask anything of me, I'm here for you. Yeah, I, I love it. it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. you. Thank you.